So again, my name here is Dennis Muren, and I, uh, I've been working at ILM since 76 on the first Star Wars. But I started doing the same stuff exactly I'm doing now when I was a kid, when I was about six or seven years old. I got interested in special effects. For some reason, I don't know how, uh, I got uh, a still camera and started shooting with little plastic dinosaurs and spaceships, you know, pictures that I had seen maybe in a movie theater or on television, because television was just starting in those days. But I always loved it. And there was never a future in it. There was no really an industry. There was no interest in effects. Occasionally, there'd be effects movies. And it was really just the work of Ray Harryhausen, who had a movie out about every year that sort of kept me and, and the few other people like myself going through those early days. Um, so I just worked and worked and worked on uh, without thinking there was any future. And suddenly, and I was going to someday have to get some job. I don't know what it was going to be, maybe. I thought maybe inhalation therapy I saw in the classified section of the paper. <laughs> But literally, along came Star Wars, and that was it. It was going to be a two-year job, and, you know, it's still going on. I think the boomers grew up with the same interest that we had, some visual interest in seeing things, and George and Stephen came along and knew how to make these compelling movies, and it's become an industry. And now there's got to be thousands and thousands of people doing the same work that, that I do all over the world, and it's just growing and growing. So it's, it's uh, really neat to, uh, to be a part of that. So what I want to show you as an introduction here is I'm going to break down a shot so you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about when we're talking about visual effects. And this is a shot from War of the Worlds. And here's the final shot. So if you, th what we're doing here is something that cannot be done in real life. It, just to make this would be way, way too expensive. It'd be dangerous, it, and yet it's the story that Steven wants to tell. Steven Spielberg made this film. And this is the sort of imagery that I, I really enjoy because it's just neat to look at. And what this is made of is, first of all, we start uh, shooting, uh, um, first of all, we, let me just get on this ahead here. We start with shooting the background, and this actors are shot against the blue screen, and we have kind of a rough idea of what it is. You've probably all seen this sort of stuff before. They don't, they don't know what they're acting against, but their actors are great. They can understand this really well. We designed the war machine for the film, which is a, supposed to be about 130 feet tall, based on H.G. Wells' design of a tripod thing. And we did quite a bit for weeks and weeks designing tons of artwork till we finally settled on this, which is kind of a modernistic World War II, if you can imagine, machine, if that had technology had gone ahead. It's not like in the War of the Worlds movie with levitation floating machine. This is an armored tank sort of that walks on, on three legs. The idea being that you can relate to it more because you can look at it and sort of see what it's made out of. And then we did some animation practices. This is all on the computer now. So now we're into the computer, and we're practicing the look of it, seeing if we can manipulate it. The animators are understanding how it's done. And uh, from this, we sort of developed the character of what that, of, you know, what, the, what it's going to be. And then we lay that behind, again, a CG thing, behind the actors, which were shot, you saw on the, the blue screen. This is an early version of the shot. So you're getting an idea now, you know, this machine's falling down behind and it's going to blow up. And what's happened is they found a weakness in the machine is what they've done, which is what's causing it to sort of collapse and die here. And then to make it, now, now, to make it look real, which it has to do, now we have what we call a rendering, which is where in, in the computer we make it look more real. So it's starting to look more real now. We added those little green weird deals because it just looks alien and interesting and maybe there makes sense to the Martians, but doesn't make any sense to us. But that's okay. As long as it looks real, it's okay that, it, that it, um, it's something we don't quite understand. Then we uh, added smoke to it. This is also computer graphics because whenever anything is on fire, it smokes. So, and that just also looks really, really neat and gives a sense of destruction that something is sort of falling apart and collapsing. Then we shot a bunch of steel wool. And this is, you can just, it's exactly what it looks like. And that's used as... Uh, just sort of laying in little dots here and there over the thing as it's falling down to put some reality in it, something that's just, you know, that, that reminds you, I've really seen this before. So it's not this literal, but it's in the shot, and it helps with it. You just see little, the little holes of it. Then we shot a background. This is a miniature about 15 feet long or so with a big plunger pushing this thing into it. And this is just what it, uh, you know, this is what it looks like when um, what we wanted to do. We could have done this computer graphics, but it seemed like it was way, way, too difficult than we could do with a model with all the dirt and fire and everything and it'd probably look more realistic. And then when you put that together, we added sparks, smoke, lens flares, and all that. 
we get a shot like this, which, I mean, I just love this stuff. And I, when I was a kid, I wish I was doing stuff this good when I was a kid, but only in my mind. And, uh, and the neat thing about it is that, um, I guess it's neat, we, you know, we do two or 3,000 shots like this at ILM a year. And around the industry, there's got to be 10,000 shots like this going on. I mean, it's, and it's happening all over the world. And before Star Wars, there was 100 people probably doing it. That was like it. You know, and 20 or 30 of them are in L.A., and some are in England, and who knows where the rest were. But it was very few people. And so in that short time to grow like that has been, has been uh, very interesting for all of us, uh, just keeping the quality up and everything. So what is it that makes a really good visual effects artist? I think what we are is we're translators. We take, uh, we have a fictional idea that the director wants that is really neat. But I feel we should start with reality, and we should study reality, figure out what reality looks like, but then translate it into this, fictional, this fiction look of it. Um, I think it's important for someone to have curiosity and a need to learn. They just want to learn. They want to be stimulated by reality. The pictures that you saw earlier when you were coming in, most of those are from my own collection. And I just, whenever I see something like that finer than that, I'll grab it and keep it. And I think this reality, this sort of childlike wonder with the world that all our kids have until they get to be about eight or so, um, I think that's sort of the spine of visual effects. And I think it gives a heart to the profession and uh, to be really excited by reality. And, it, and I think reality is just endlessly fascinating. Uh, it's also important, I think, to have a skill in another skill set other than movies, you know, um, because you'll bring it to to the, uh, the profession. You know, I uh, say say it's in photography or you're, you like sculpture or like music or writing, any number of creative jobs, you will bring that to visual effects, if you can imagine. And it probably works the inverse also. Um, it gives a heart uh, or it, um, it, it there's, there's sort of like uh, pursuits that you've had in the past uh, that you bring can give sort of a personal focus to the work you do, and it'll differentiate it from someone else's. These shots that you see are literally not easy. They're not, they're not just cookie cutter. There's a hundred ways to translate any shot. The one you just saw could be done a hundred different ways. Same thing, machine falling down the background, people coming to our camera, uh, blowing up, and it would look different depending on who did it. And that sensibility is really important and what distinguishes one person's work from another. Uh, it's also important, of course, in, uh, to understand uh, films and visual storytelling uh, because we are working in that medium. And I think to know the history of effects, too, because a lot of great ideas were discovered 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and they still relate to what we're doing today. Now, my background is that I am uh, sort of a cameraman, an effects cameraman. So that's kind of what I bring to visual effects. Uh, I've always liked images, as you saw the, from my library up there, which is a fraction of what I've got. I like movies. I like spectacle. I like mystery. I like interesting looking characters. And here's some more of the uh, sort of shots that, oh, that one was up there. I don't know if that was up there for a while. Um, but that was, this is one, actually, when I was about five, I don't know if anyone knows what this is. This is the firefall at Yosemite. And they used to do this. And when I was five years old, I remember uh, seeing this. And we go back every couple of years. And they dropped the fire, a bonfire of, of bark and stuff off of El Capitan and would fall 3,000 feet. And they did it every night in the summer. So it was very safe. They knew what they were doing. They had rocks down below, put itself out. But it was a real magic. And I think that's, uh, I don't think that's really sparked my interest in wanting to do visual effects. But it's very similar to the crazy challenges that I am asked to do today when you think about what a waterfall of fire would look like is just the type of thing were asked to do, and it was really going on at that very, very young age. And then they, they stopped doing this in the late 60s because uh, they, they thought it was hurting the Yosemite because that would never naturally happen in Yosemite. But it was an amazing thing to see. So I see something like this, and it's just really interesting. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, these shots, and I've got hundreds of them, like I said, I just find compelling. And... You know, they're, they're like a perfect moment of something. Something like this is extremely manipulated, but it looks just beautiful. This is a, uh, I don't think it's St. Helen, but it might be. This big lava dome section has recently ripped up a few hundred feet in the air. That's why it's so smooth on one side, the lava dome, but then, I don't know how long it took, but this chunk of it has come up like it's getting ready to uh, possibly erupt again. 
some beautiful, beautiful stuff here. This looks like a visual effect in itself, but it's real. And you just look at all the stuff that makes it real, and I think it's just, it's just you know, fascinating. So I think, uh, I think there's five fundamental opportunities or issues that we in effects are facing at the moment. And how we deal with these uh, are really going to sort of shape the future. Um, one of them is sort of the poetry of effects. And I think that is a connection that we have with the director. And I think it's important that, uh, and we actually try to do this, is work very carefully with the director and encourage his uh, imagination to come out and give him ideas of things he may not have thought of and try to do those um, in, you know, for the budget we have and the time frame we have. We try to interpret his work and free his imagination. And that combination of uh, when a director and uh, an effects group comes together, uh, it, it can make some pretty uh, amazing images. And this is one that we did recently in Newark for more of the worlds of Spielberg. Using these tools we've got, the, uh, our freedom and to evoke these, ama these new images. And whenever I finish something like this, you know, no matter how much time I worked on it, I try to sort of look at it as, as past, it's historical, let's move on to something else so that I, we don't copy ourselves, we move ahead. So another point I want to bring up is the importance of, that was sort of the poetic, you know, the director dealing with the effects people, like the director should team with everybody and they usually do. Uh, what do we do about reality? I think reality, like I was saying, is really important. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the stuff, that, some of the work we've been seeing is, isn't looking as real maybe even as it used to. And I think we've got to remind ourselves that to start with reality on this. And uh, not to be careful to just copy other movies. A lot of effects people copy other movies. And the, those movies are copies maybe of either other movies or copies of reality, but it's like a Xerox of a Xerox. We've gotten away from what we're doing, which is experiencing life, and we've gotten, you know, and we're just copying movies over and over again. So uh, something I always do is just keep thinking. If, you don't, if, you can, if you're having trouble trying to figure out something and you say, okay, I've taken it about as far as I can go, I've solved that, but you're still not comfortable with it, maybe if you'd spent five more seconds thinking about it, it might, the answer might have come to you. So just keep, keep figuring things out. And uh, I've got great um, respect for the power of, of artists and the, the human mind to be able to solve problems. So another thing that, uh, that we're trying to do in the effects business or should be doing is to expand the communication between us and the filmmakers and the directors and all. And this is going on now, but it's going to keep going. Uh, we used to work thousands of miles apart. We'd be shooting in England, and other people would be in L.A., or we'd be in San Francisco working on effects. Uh, we communicated with paper, you know, notes back and forth, fax machines, mail, uh, telephones, we'd, or we'd guess <laughs> what the other person wanted, you know, hunches or something. As these shots are in development, the director needs to kind of see them so he can give feedback on them. And, and is, is the idea I have really what the director has? That all takes connection and relationships. Uh, and, and being right there, understanding it and seeing it. So, you know, because you can't be together all the time now because the world has gotten so big and they're small, I should say. We're shooting all over the world. We need to develop tools, and we have been successful in developing tools to make that smaller. Uh, for War of the Worlds, for example, uh, we had a very, very short schedule on that show. And Stephen did what we call previs. He designed the effect sequences in advance with really crude computer graphic models, but he could kind of find his angles that he wanted and all. And uh, he had the guy who was doing the actual work for him, the previous guy, on the set as we were shooting it, which was really great. And in the morning, he'd, he'd get another idea and have the previous guy work on an idea for a shot. And he'd usually do it in two or three hours. So by the time the afternoon came, Stephen had a preview of the shot and could say, I like it or I don't like it, let's move the camera over, and he'd shoot it, but he, but he didn't take time trying to figure out what he wanted because he knew it uh, by seeing this pre-visualization. It was modified on the set, and that really saved a lot of time. And we had tests going concurrently in San Francisco at ILM, and here in New York, uh, we were shooting, we were shooting in Virginia, all over the place for that film. And now another thing that happens when, when you're doing this as far as distance is, when, if you're doing a movie with characters, and there's a lot of them that have got computer graphic characters of some sort in them, 
they're essentially actors in the movie. Well, the director wants to be able to and should be directing those characters. And often the animation that's done on that or the creation of the characters is done months later. After the, after the first unit shot, the actors are gone. We'll be back there anywhere, any company that's doing the work is back doing it at their, in their country and they have to have contact with the director. And that can take a long time. And still we can do it by the tools I just sort of mentioned. But we came up with something for Pirates 2, and it's now going to be seen as soon, Pirates 3, Pirates of the Caribbean, that gives much more control of the animation to the director when he's in the zone, and that's when he's making the movie. And that's when he's actually shooting the shot he's doing. That's when he's thinking about it. And it's, it's uh, a motion capture technique, which you may have heard about, where people can dress in sort of an outfit, and they, they wear dots and all like that, and they can kind of move around. You record that, and the computer... And by putting it into a computer, you can take those motions and put it into a CG character. So because the Pirates movies, it was so important to have these, you know, uh, Davy Jones and all the other characters that are human-shaped, it was perfect for having actors perform those. But we've never been able to do motion capture actually on the set. So which would normally would mean that you'd shoot this background scene, say, with Johnny Depp, although it wasn't on this film. And three or four or five months later, you'd have the actors back shooting the other character. But the guys, not, they're not thinking the same. It's months later, and it just doesn't have the, the, the magic that happens when everybody's working together on something, and they're thinking about that at 6.45 at night. And they've been working all day, and they're really, you know, they're really working. So what we came up with, was a way to do mocap on the set. And here is a shot. This is all from Pirates 2. I can't show you anything from Pirates 3. But here's the way the shot came out. So this is a computer graphic, computer generated character. And the performance is by Bill Nye. All all computers are. You could never, you know, do all this stuff with a guy in a suit and makeup or anything. It wouldn't look nearly as amazing as that. So what we actually shot is this. So he's wearing the outfit, but he's still, he's still the actor. He's, he's not thinking as much about, well, I look silly because he trusts us. And so, and he's overacting a little bit because he knows he needs to to get through all that expression that's going to have on there. And he just absolutely nailed it through the whole show. So we can take this footage, which we have this camera, which is the main camera shooting, and we have two other video cameras off to the side, which you see in the two corners there. So we have three positions. So we're essentially we're triangulating like a GPS where each one of these dots is in space. And we do that for every frame of film, for every dot that he's wearing. And he's actually on the set. And then we could, if we lay that in the computer, we then uh, we make a rough, this is just the backbone, the spine, the skeleton of the CG guy. We see it fit sort of right in space where he was. So this is like the, the blue you see is in the computer, that a spine of the character, not all rendered, laid over him. And you can see it's right where he was walking, going through the same motions. And then when you put it together... What you get is every, you know, it's all working. It's his mind is right there directing it. So look at this. This little bit that he does right here. That little, who would have ever thought of that? And then you see it in the final shot. And I always thought that was because he was working with Johnny Depp, who did the same wonderful original acting. And Johnny probably inspired everybody, or Bill inspired Johnny. Who knows what goes on? That doesn't happen the way effects usually were done when they would be done in these, they had to do the technology in these separate, unrelated areas. You know, now they can come together and you get this, just this amazing sort of stuff. And I sent my a friend to a lifetime of solitude in your name while you roam free. So you can see the, the performance comes through. It's not being interpreted by an animator. And even, you know, the renderings we're getting are just pretty phenomenal. That looks really like, uh, you know, a real object on the, 
on the uh, left over there, but it's not an object. It's completely generated in the computer. We thought we might put the, Bill's eyes in the CG one if we couldn't get the eyes to look right, but it, uh, we managed to get the eyes to look right, so the entire thing is all uh, simulated. That's been a really great tool. You're going to be seeing more and more of that. That's going to help get the cost down, get the characters and films more interesting to look at, be able to tell more fantastic stories. Uh, our schedules are getting incredibly short. This helps because we don't have the lag between when, the, when we have to start the animation, we can get it on the set. That helps us. But it's been pretty tough for everybody to, uh, to be able to do these movies now when you were working six-day weeks and... 12 or more hours a day to get these big uh, tentpole movies, as we call them out for the summer. Um, and that's really, uh, and also, you know, the quality can go down, and lots of things can go down when that happens, especially with an industry that has just, just started, like I said, just, you know, a few, you know, a couple of decades ago has really grown. And, and the problem we have now is not only quality, but also our own health, which is number four on my list, which is what I'm calling creative health. And because it is such a rapid, time of rapid change, um, we don't want to lose the magic of what effects can do, which is to tantalize and invite and to unfold the story uh, in a natural manner, similar to the way you uh, learn things in everyday life. That takes It's a little hard to do that, but it certainly is worth it. Uh, and they've been massively successful, these films. Again, sort of iconic images that are going with us forever, possibly, passed on to other generations. But uh, are we sort of victims of our own success? Uh, the demand for this work just grows and grows, and um, the, so a lot of the top people have are, are cannot do all the work. So a lot of middle uh, middle people, middle quality people, or whatever you want to call them, are moved in middle level people moved into some of the top positions, and some students coming out of school go right into key positions, and they're learning as fast as they can, but it just takes time to learn it. So that's something that we're trying to deal with, with internal education and, and classes. And I'm actually writing a book at the moment uh, on the power of observation, how we should be learning from reality, because none, none of the schools teach that, um, to just to observe. You know, guys, like I was saying earlier, people are coming in out of schools now, and they're copying the computer graphics they, that I did in Jurassic Park. And I was copying, you know, elephants and lions and stuff like that. They need to be copying elephants and lions, not the work that we did. So this book hopefully is going to be an inspiration to give examples of stuff that people can, uh, can learn as they come into the field. And uh, so the last thing on my list that uh, we are working on or need to be aware of is what I'm sort of calling immersion. And it's a couple of things. And the one is sort of, you know, we're, gonna, we're getting a lot more into movies now, into the reality of it, and, and sort of competing with, with uh, television, uh, the 3D, it looks like it's emerging. I don't know if any of you folks have seen a recent 3D movie. They're getting better. They're not hard to look at. But when they're done right, I think you'll get a much more experience of being actually at the event. And I like the idea of three-dimensional films if they're done right. Um, I saw some tests that actually had been done on Casablanca, on the end of Casablanca, where they made it in 3D. And if I was a kid, not a kid, an adult, and I had a choice of seeing the old Casablanca here or pay $2 more and see it in 3D, I just would go see it in 3D because it's a neater experience. And IMAX, big screen, is going into 3D. So in home theaters, you know, is, is there. I think the movies are, the 3D doesn't work as well on a smaller screen as it does in big. But this immersion is very powerful. And uh, is, do, is there an obligation we have? Is there an ethical consideration that should come with that? Um, are we creating people who are going to be just passive? Are they going to want to go to Yosemite uh, at the IMAX theater for a four-hour trip that is in 3D and, and is easier than getting on a plane and flying there and enjoying it and smelling it and all that sort of stuff. But, but they're afraid to travel. Who knows what it might be? I don't know. Are, they, are people going to be disconnected? You know, is there, do we have an obligation not to encourage uh, like violence? You know, video games, there's talk about 
you know, are those encouraging people? Who knows? But once you get immersed into 3D experiences and movies and big screens, we really feel a part of it. Uh, we, you know, we need to be careful, and that, and that goes into pornography also. So there's a lot of questions there that that we need to ask itself. We've got a few people work and you know, refuse to work on some shows in the industry. Uh, that hasn't happened very often. I, you hear about them, but I can, I think they're that you know may grow. I don't know. I'm not sure. And the inverse of that are there sort of humanitarian things we can be doing uh, to portray more vividly, you know, things that we should be talking about that might have an influence uh, on people and influence on the world uh, as, uh, as you know, we're, as we all get older and, and things seem to be sort of crumbling in some ways around us. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of it. I'd like to invite uh, David Denby up now for a little talk, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, all. It's a pleasure to meet so many of our readers and people who are interested in the magazine. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of ironic that The New Yorker is sp sponsoring uh, this kind of incredibly high-tech event because, apart from newspapers, I guess, magazines are the low-tech communications medium and, if anything, regressive. And that's, I was, I was just saying to Dennis beforehand, we think that's why we're going to survive because we can be picked up and read in the bathtub and in bed and uh, it looks good and feels good and even smells good sometimes. Um, but perhaps because we're low tech, we're in awe of people like Dennis and some of you who are involved in these things. Uh, you know, there are jokers who say that uh, all movies are special effects since it's, when it's film, at any rate, it's still photos uh, projected at 24 frames a second and smoothed into motion by the phenomenon of persistence of vision. But um, what he does is not ordinary movie making, but a kind of attempt at transcendence uh, to show things that are unimaginable for most of us, either unimaginably beautiful or unimaginably horrifying um, and, and appalling. And people have been doing this almost from the beginning of movies, as, as Dennis said. Um, his Voyage to the Moon in 1902, uh, Georges Melius film in which the spaceship comes and lands in uh, the eye of the man in the moon. Um, and we don't normally think of the arts as being progressive. A new novel or new poem isn't necessarily better than uh, an old one, but uh, special effects, because they are so closely generated by technology, allied to technology, are progressive, um, and things do look better and better. And how, I was wondering, how do you feel when you look at some things that you did 25 years ago or 30 years ago? Do you think, I'd like to do it again, or do you think it's beautiful the way it is? Um, if you could do them over again, would you? Or, or do, don't they have their own integrity and beauty for that period and for that expressive use? Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's both. You know, I really I feel, hey, it was the best we could do at the time. A lot of it I'm really, really happy with. But it's, to me, everything's a work in progress. And I tell you, I'm, I was there with George when we were talking about redoing the original Star Wars series and fixing some of the shots up, and I had my list of shots I wanted to redo that we just didn't have time to do right the first time around. But, but I think you want to keep both versions. I really want, you know, always have the original there, that, and, and if you want to have another shot at it, I'm fine with that. But weren't there howls of protest from some of yeah. the fans and the purists when the revised version right. came out? What is it? You added some creatures and you... No, that's, yeah, I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm, I'm, that's more of what George... I was just talking yeah. about the dog fights in the spaceship stuff in the, in the original Star Wars, especially episode one and episode two, which is now episode four and episode five in those, where, you know, they're kind of funky looking. And I tell you, you know, it'd be three in the morning trying to get a maneuver on a spaceship that was really difficult to do. And it just, it, you know, could never quite get it. And here you got a chance to kind of redo it. Right. <laughs> so close encounters of the mm -hmm. third kind, the, the mothership, which so many of us were so thought was so beautiful, an image, I'm sure you all remember it. That was done with a model, right? Right. So if you could do that again, yeah, you know, what do you think you would I, do? It? I think that's just beautiful. I don't know what I'd do differently about it. You know, that whole film is just wonderful, and the ethereal quality and the magic of light and object. And 
Yeah, really, I'm just talking about technical things, which I was referring to Star Wars. Right. The ideas, the designs of the X-Wings and the way they flew, the design of the mothership, the look of it, that stuff, you know, we really did, really have, we have time on Star, on Close Encounters to do it. More time, little It's awesomely yeah. beautiful and when yeah. the thing comes over. And, beautiful, right. And partly it's the response of the way everyone looks at it and, the, and also the control of the soundtrack, as I remember the extraordinary mm -hmm. oral effects. Mm -hmm. um, now, the big shift in your time was, I guess, from optical to digital. And I know you took a year off, is this right, after the abyss? Was it, was it 89 or 90? Right, right. And so you went through what, a kind of crisis or a period of learning? Or explain what happened it, to you well, in that year. George had started this computer graphic group in 1980 with the idea that computer graphic images were going to be somewhere. And it took longer to develop than, than any of us wanted. And, and I didn't know, I don't know if any of us knew, it was actually going to even pan out sometime. Uh, but as, as someone who does a show a year and seeing this, this carrot out there and wanting to get it, and it's always farther away, yeah. um, it seemed like it was just never going to get done. And, and never, you know, how much R&D can you do on it? And then we did the abyss, which, gave, which to me, uh, in 70, whenever it was, 88, gave, or 89, just looked amazing. And I thought, this yeah. is going to work. And I don't understand it. So I took a, a year off, and I bought a book by uh, Foley and Van Dam. I don't know if you guys, anybody knows that. They did a 1,200-page computer graphic book for schools. I don't have a clue about computer graphics. And I bought it, and I read it with my wife down at the local coffee shop every day little bit, and it was terrible to understand, but I didn't need to really understand why. I kind of understood that you could do stuff, and that gave me a confidence in myself, not to program or anything like that, but to see, yes, this does work. You know, the trick of it is this and that, and then we came back and we did T2 and Jurassic Park, and not that I didn't bring all that together. It was all coming, but, but I could push it and say, hey, you know, try this, try that. But you personally, did you start working on computers in a way that you hadn't before and try yeah. out things and yeah so but this must i'm just curious in the personal dimension this must have been a little nerve-wracking i mean so for a whole technology to suddenly no shift because up. we never knew it was going to shift this was before the shift i see this was like the pandora's box of wonders was opening up but nobody's doing it yet you know i got to do this you know and i kind of had to sneak it into ilm on macintoshes with early versions of photoshop doing digital stuff because uh, the old timers were scared to death of it, that were there, and and then I so I, it was a ground swelling, and it took a year before we really got it going, and that's when we did T2. And T2 has all, all of those inc incredible. Um, I'm sure you remember the liquid uh, metal uh, that solidifies and morphs into a human. I think I guess it was Freud who said the scariest thing is not something that's completely alien, but something that's partly human and partly alien. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, there's an idea there, whereas the, I guess the dinosaurs are alien. Or, you, did you, or would they give them human elements also? Well, we gave them animal elements. Yeah. Animal yeah. elements. Yeah. yeah. Right. We, wanted, we didn't want the, the Jurassic Park dinosaurs to be Disney dinosaurs. They, they were not, they were not uh, like at all like people wanted to be. They were like wild animals. So we studied wild animal footage. You know, you never know. And on, even on your home, your, your pet cat, what it's going to do two seconds from now. You got no idea. Right. We made sure you never had any understanding with that any of those dinosaurs were going to do two seconds from now. That's the way animals are. They're just spontaneous, and you don't know what's going to happen with them. And that was unusual for for those type of movies to have something like that. Now, the most amazing thing to me was the scene in which all the smaller creatures come bounding across a field like gazelle. Oh yeah, uh huh. Um, as, as well as the violent things, there was a lot of poetry in that movie. Right. A lot yeah, of yeah. Stephen is just wonderful on that. Right. Now, the, the, how does it, you, you sort of touched on this, but come back now to the script stage. Is he saying, Dennis, this is what I want? Or are you saying, no, Stephen, do it this way? Or do, do you, ha, ha, what kind of back and forth? And it must be different with each director. You yeah. With Cameron, with Gore Verbinski, with George Lucas. Um, right, yeah. And I haven't worked with Gore now. You know, my, I'm, you're seeing work from a lot of people up here. It's not just me, but, but we all do work the same, and the directors are all different. And Stephen uh, has the ideas, the script's done, but he's open to ideas on things. Anything that's going to make it better, he's open to it. Jim Cameron is open to it, but he's got storyboards for every shot, and they... Like Hitchcock, it's all yeah, drawn out. It's all drawn out, and it may never change. And it may, but it may not. And so he's... And because he plans the whole film out in advance, I don't know if he wants to leave much to chance. You know, I'm not sure how 
quite why the way he works that way. But he's very open also. But Stephen's really open. George is open for anything on it. And they all, everybody is different. Now, take us back to the street scene in, uh, at the beginning of uh, War of the Worlds, which you showed an excerpt of. Um, how, how much of that is planned out in the event? Obviously, if, if Tom Cruise is dancing around like that, he's been instructed to do that. And then, so is that all in the script, or is that, or is that you, you mentioned that you can mock some of it up quickly on a computer. How, yeah, it, it, it's... Was that actually shot in Hoboken? It's yeah. supposed to be Hoboken. I think, no, I think it was Newark. Newark, it's, it's okay. Intersection 5 Street. All right, so he's actually in Newark. Yeah. He's on actual Newark streets. It's yeah. filmed, it's photographed. Then what happens then? How do you get... Well, to... it's, it's when we got the script. The script says the ground's cracking, the ground's okay. rotating. And Stephen gets together with storyboard artists and us, and they embellish it. And that's, that's where one director will say, okay, let's just do it this way, blows up, creature comes out. Next shot, the church blows up. Stephen says, wait a minute, I want this to be like, like you know, you're in... You know, you're in England or someplace in World War II. How are you? How is this battle really going to happen to you? So it starts small and grows. You react to it. You react to it. You're you're thinking, what's next? I don't know. Oh, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. You know, and that's what he brought to that. And but so by the time we got to the set, we knew the ground was going to crack, but we couldn't crack the street because we only had it for sure. a few hours a day. But we put marks on the ground. So and Tom, a great actor. All actors are fabulous on being able to imagine stuff. And Tom's great and gave everything to it to imagine, and you, you believe it totally, he's jumping across a crack. So he's, he's looking his, at his marks, literally, yeah, and yeah. dancing around them. Using his imagination. To, you know, and, I, and we remind him what's going on around him. Things are falling. You could be hit by this. You know, Put him in the place and then let him act. So much of what you said about reality uh, impressed me, and particularly in regard to that scene. One of the things, that, particularly in Spielberg's films, is you always feel the weight of something. Mm -hmm. Like, the, remember, the car crashing down and... Uh, or falling off the top of the trestle and, and, right. and coming down. So you guys are playing a kind of, there's a kind of complicated dance. On the one hand, you're violating all the laws of time and space and kicking Newton over. And on the other hand, as, as you say, um, weight matters, gravity still matters. And, and those things wouldn't matter emotionally unless the laws of time and space were operating normally around <laughs> all the crazy things that you're doing. That's what, yeah, that, that the world is reacting the same. Gravity is right. the same. Somehow there's this crazy 130-foot tall machine that should be falling over that isn't. That's the only part you don't understand about it. And, like, if you could get past that, <laughs> then if a car falls, it should really do damage. I mean, we dropped real, the real car on top of the other car. That was all real things. Hit. That was real. Well, no, we did them separate as effects. And we, did, we could do those back in L.A., but, but that sort of stuff wasn't fake, you know, because the reality is, is there. We really crushed stuff on location when we could. Now, you said that you spoke of the danger of copying other films. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, isn't there also a, a, the problem that in pulling kids out of their little multitasking pleasure dens, you know, I watch my son w working on a computer on pleasure instant dance. messengering and looking over his shoulder. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, and playing the guitar at the same time. Uh, you know, don't you have to keep upping the ante in yeah. some way to make things more and more spectacular, more extraordinary, more imaginative? I mean, it's, that must be terrifying. It's, it's fun. Yeah. I mean, it's just great. I mean, it's like, you, you know, who wants to do the same thing twice? So, you know, it, right. it, it, every, every show is an opportunity. It's not a job. It's, if you can do it the same way it's been done before, then it's kind of, oh, I'm doing it, and I'm getting a paycheck, and it's okay. Or it's an opportunity to go where something hasn't done, you haven't done before. Have you ever said, I don't want to do this, it's silly, it's boring, it's redundant? I just said no. Uh, yeah, there's some shows that I'm not as interested in. I don't know what it is that, that compels me to pick this. You know, I, it's, it's the whole combination's got to be there. I've got to be free. I try to take time off to be with my family, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. I'm writing a book at the moment. So, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't just do anything. There's usually something in there that, that I respond to. Is, is there a danger of digital fatigue that the audience could OD? Yeah. Uh, you sort of touched on that. Yeah, I, sure, I think so. And the danger is boredom or that? Familiarity. It's it doesn't not, seem exciting It does anymore. not exciting. You're seeing everything. It's the same deal, but if you cut out all the middle part that's real that you can relate to and all you have is the spectacle, you know, then it's, it's maybe fine for three minutes. And what do you do if something's running for 12 minutes? Or so you're against spectacle minutes? for its own sake in any circumstance. Oh, I, it has to always be expressive and it, it all It all fits in the story. I mean, if there's, if there's a way to build it up for a phenomenal 
spectacle near the end. That's okay if you've built up to it. But, you know, George and Stephen, I don't know if they're still doing this, used to talk about the set piece. And the set piece is the way a movie ended. And it's the mothership. It's in Close Encounters. It's the dogfight at the end of Star Wars. It would be a final 15 minutes that the whole movie's building up to that you could say is spectacle. Mm -hmm. But it's really plot coming together and all that sort of stuff. If it's done right, it's great in something like that because you, you're ready for it. You're being told a wonderful story, and you're going to get this great ending. It, it's going to be wonderful for 15 minutes and an incredibly satisfying 30 seconds from the end of it. And then you have this big release, and, oh, they're going to win, or we're alive, or whatever it is. You know, it's all uh, emotions. That, are, that, that you're feeling, and it's all directed right. by in the making of the film. It's now, very, very planned out. To jump ahead to 3D, the complaint against it always has been that it's, it hasn't worked yet as a narrative medium that people are impressed. Um, I've, I've been out to Cameron, James Cameron's place in mm -hmm. Santa Monica, and uh, I've seen some underwater stuff, and the, you know, the fish do really, really swim by your, your head. You lose the frame. Mm -hmm. You're in it. Um, but I, I think at some level, uh, I want the frame. In other words, if it's two dimensions and with only the third implied, you're, you're sort of the audience is being part of the art form. They're, they're yeah. finishing the film, so to speak, whereas if it's three, all the work could be done for you in a way. Was that what you were getting at at the end or when you said it could be too real? No, no, I, 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 I agree. Is there still an art form when it's yeah, real? Yeah, absolutely. I agree. You're, you're talking about where some people were in... in 193, when the law was, if you're making a movie, never have anything come closer than 15 feet to the camera, because <laughs> the audience freaked out. I mean, one of the one of the I was reading I was reading, reading the uh, Prague Gone By book, yeah. and the guy he talks in that about how a guy took his camera out in the early turn of the century, went down to the beach around here, and had just shot waves coming up and right under the camera because that was against the rules of movie making. It all had to be back where a stage would be or beyond. Things could not come out in the theater. So people went crazy. People were running out of the theater. Then they start liking it. And I think that's where we are in 3D. It's like right now, it's like I don't get it. It's confusing. But once as, as observers, we get into that world and we can, we can un embrace it and understand that we're now working in a cube of telling a story instead right. of a flat plane. And it'll take a few years. And it's got to take good filmmakers to do it then that becomes your means of expression. Your stage is a cube. And that's well, what's exciting to me about it. All the lighting, um, as well as camera movement, as, as well as the laws of perspective, direct your eye right. in a two-dimensional plane. Right. It's all so, going to be redone. So now, aren't we going to be confused at first? Where do I look? Where do I go? It's all Isn't everything equal? No, it's because it's, then you're, you're working on The art of it is to make it Yeah, the art, it's the dramatic. art of it, and we don't know it yet because it's just, it's just opening up to us right now. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's going to take a few years to figure it out, and, you know, trial, error, and, and guys getting into it and really understanding it. But I, I mean, just imagine walking around here like you were earlier, you know, on the other side here, and, and the feeling spatially of walking around and seeing people go by and everything, and then con conceive a movie that way, how you would tell that story. And that's, as opposed to seeing it on a plane with cuts and stuff like that, that's the kind of mindset it's going to take. You think there might be movies. much less cutting? There may be. There may be. Yeah. But camera movement wouldn't be restricted. There's no reason for we that. Don't, we don't know yet. Yeah. It, uh, it may. <laughs> it may. Just to come back, when, when, when you work with Spielberg, who loves a moving camera, does that make your job a lot more difficult since someone's like Tom Cruise just before, just after... You're, the end of that sequence, he runs directly towards the camera, right, and uh, on the street when there are things yeah, it makes floating it, all over. Does that make your job a hell of a lot more it difficult? It makes it a hell of a lot more difficult, and that's all, what I've been pushing for since I was a kid. I look back at my early movies I did, and I was moving the camera. Because as a kid growing up, I could always tell in early movies of the 50s that the camera could never move when an effect shot came on, and I hated it. So I've always fought that. So the fact that it makes it more difficult, I don't care. You know, you just have to do it. It's the end yeah. result that is what you're after. And I pushed for that, and George really pushed for it in Star Wars. And the reason that motion control stuff was developed for Star Wars was he wanted to pan the camera during the battle scenes of the spaceships flying around. Up till that time, camera locked off, flying goes through like this. Camera locked off, something goes through like that. I That's see. not energy, you know. So we had to invest in this technology that hadn't even been proven. It's that, you know, to try it. I mean, the scary thing about technology, we were talking about it about computer graphics earlier, is you don't know that it's going to work. 
So the process of doing it can either be horrifying if you've got a deadline or phenomenally liberating if you're almost there. And so you're inventing, nothing, so to speak, on the set. Without knowing it's going to necessarily work. Yeah. Right. So it's a d real dangerous but very exciting. And how many day. stages away from that set shooting do you have to get before you know it works? I mean, there might be six months down the road and you've already yeah. committed, you know, at God knows how many weeks. Right. You have, you have backup plans. You're trying. Backup plan. I had backup plans for every shot in T2. Backup plans for most of the shots in Jurassic. About halfway through Jurassic, we knew it was all going to work. And then we were actually changing, redesigning the shots to take advantage of it. So by the end of the film, uh, this last stuff it. we shot was better and, and more daring than we shot at the beginning. Is, is it shot in sequence in terms of the final? No. Oh, if you see the film, the last stuff we did is actually the last stuff. That is the last. Al almost yeah. the last stuff. Almost. Isn't that unusual to shoot? Yeah. yeah. It just worked out that way for the sets. What is the single, your single most, your most loved <laughs> sequence of, of your work? Uh, you know, I don't know if I have one, but I tell you, this Newark sequence just somehow it just it. came yeah. together. And I don't, you know, we were on a very tight schedule. Everybody was clicking, and and uh, the town was great. The people were great. Uh, there were just four days, and came that back. That was done in four day. days. Yeah. Because there was there was very little destruction. I mean, there wasn't anything. We put some pieces of broken, you know, and painted foam core, or not foam right. core, but styrofoam on the ground to look like things, but it was just a reference, just a guide. Everything else was added. Well, I think uh, we're all very eager to see what happens next. Me too. In this art form, and uh, it's been a great privilege to speak to one of the leaders and inventors. Thank you all for coming. Um, perhaps Dennis can hang around a bit and talk to you individually, uh, and right, uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Right, thank you.